FOMO. I'm Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd when they should be blazing a trail of their own. But if you want to achieve greatness in business and life, you've got to break free. Come on, I'll show you how. This is FOMO Sapiens, where we explore how entrepreneurial thinkers find the inspiration and the courage to build exceptional lives. All right, welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for entrepreneurial thinkers. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis. And today we are talking to Freddie Vega, the co-founder and CEO of Platzi, Latin America's most popular ed tech startup. And according to the internet, Freddie, besides being a very charming character, is also controversial on social media where his hot takes often land him in hot water. I got, Freddie, I got that right off the internet. And also one thing that's pretty interesting, Freddie is a little different than some of his other founders in Latin America. He comes from a working class neighborhood of Bogota. And then from there, he met up with his Guatemalan co-founder, Christian Vanderhens, and joined Y Combinator in 2015, started Platzi, and is now a major figure in the Latin American startup world and a friend of mine. This is an episode we're gonna be talking about entrepreneurship, being a founder in Latin America, and also building an online identity while doing so. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, Freddy Vega. Mr. McGinnis, thank you very much. It is an honor to be finally here. We have never met before. This is my first time <laughs> seeing you in real life. I don't know who you are, but you just took me off the street and I'm already happy to be here. We'll get into that in a minute, but uh, I do want to start. We always start the same question. And even you, with your dry sense of humor, will not escape me. So, Freddie, the question is this. Tell me something unexpected you learned about yourself that changed everything. Whew. This is an easy question. I know, right? Um, we go deep yeah. right away. <laughs> All right. I'm, and, and, and I'm going to honor the question. Thank you. Um, as, as you mentioned before, I grew up in, in relative poverty. Like, I, my family didn't... We were not hungry, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, my first computer, I had it when I was 16. And I was able to work enough to be able to pay for my first computer. And my first internet connection, I had to, I didn't, I didn't steal an identity, but I, 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 um, I borrowed it for a little bit. A friend of mine was already uh, 18 years old and, I, and could get an internet connection. So he lent me his identity for me to get my first internet connection at home. Um, I give you these, uh, these details because of something that I think shaped me and I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, my, I, I, I grew up with my mom and my grandmother because mm. uh, my father left us when I was four years old. Um, and it was great. I mean, all things considered, it was really great. And then at a point, more or less around that point where I got my first computer and then I got my first internet connection, uh, my grandma got very sick. Mm. Uh, sick to the point that needed constant care. And my extended family, which is relatively big. Uh, she had many kids. Well, we went to them to ask for help and no one wanted to help at all. Mm. And keep in mind that for 18, 20 years in my brain, these were my very close family that were always with us. And mostly they didn't want to help because all of them said that they didn't have any money to help at all. Mm. Even mm. though I did a whole financial analysis on how much it cost to, to care for my grandma and it wasn't that much. And, and then, and okay, they don't have any money, that's fine. But then what happened later is how they justify it. They didn't just justify it by saying that they didn't have any money. They also mentioned things that apparently my grandma did many years ago, like, well, she hit me when I was a kid, so I'm not sure that I went to help. Or you have more money than us, so you don't need our help. Like it was, it was very mean in a weird mm. way. Mm. And as years went by, I processed it as a way for them to justify, I guess, their lack of money. 
and, 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 and the reason why they just didn't want to participate on it. And at first it hurt me, but it also left in me an impression of, I never want to make money an issue for my family ever again. Yeah. Like it, it got clear to me that an illusion that I had about my extended family got broken just by asking them for money to help with my grandma. Uh, in the end, what we did is that my mom, my brother and I had eight hour shifts to take care of my grandma. And we wow. did that for like six months. And, and I don't regret anything. Like in retrospective, it's something that really um, built me up and showed me what I was capable of. And I never had any problems with money ever again. It, it, like, it really got into my brain that this is something that breaks families. So I'm going to assure that it never breaks mine ever again. Yeah, crucible moment there, right? It is <laughs> when your entire worldview, what you think reality is, is exposed by, I mean, it's really interesting that people would like sort of backfill and rationalize behavior in order to avoid doing something like that, you know, that, that is like a, that's a big wake up call when your reality and, and your illusions are compared side by side. Now we're going to talk all about what you've built with Platzi. And I mean, really the way I think about it, the focus on education, you're giving that gift to everybody else in the region that works with you. But before we do, I mean, this is, I'm making a hard turn right now, Freddie. So prepare yourself, like put in the seatbelt. I want to talk before we go there about Stockholm. Because I All think right. it's important that we expose <laughs> that we expose the experience that we had in June in Stockholm together. So, oh yes, how yeah, would yeah. you summarize what the heck happened to us in Sweden? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I can summarize it. Let's see. I think <laughs> that we that we were um, consensually assaulted yeah. in a tasty way. <laughs> Guys, so what happens is I'm in I'm in Sweden for the Brilliant Minds conference, and then I get this, I guess a, a DM or a WhatsApp from Freddie, and he says, "Are you in Sweden?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah dude." And so uh, he says, "What are you doing on Saturday?" And I was like, "Nothing. I'll be done with this thing." And he's like, "Meet me at 8:40 p.m. at a place called Punk Royale." Okay, I'll let you take it from there, Freddie. So in my brain, I didn't want to go to a, like a, I mean, I like Patrick a lot, more than I will admit publicly. Um, <laughs> but I, but I, I, didn't, I didn't want to go to like a super fancy restaurant and Stockholm is full of very fancy, extremely expensive restaurants. Yeah. But I also wanted something unique. And I started Googling like what options did I have? And I found this like mysterious place, like go to Pong Royal, but don't ask many questions. Or just go to Pong Royal. Pong Royal is like unique, but not fancy, but very unique, uh, and be ready for a long experience. Fine. So um, we do a reservation for Pong Royale, and it's shrouded in mystery. And what happened is that, first of all, they research who you are before you get in. So they already have a sense of who they're welcoming, which was mind blowing. Do you mm. remember the, how, how would you describe the, the person that welcomed us to Pong Royale? The woman? Well, she was wearing, yes. uh, bicycle shorts, a t-shirt that was kind of ripped open and had tape covering one of her breasts. Everybody was wearing bicycle shorts and none of the guys had shirts on. It was just a lot of skin in that place. And everybody's like 25 and very thin and fit. Which is, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, it's uh, kind of like going to a, a bike race with no shirts. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the chefs was just wearing boxers and an apron. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And it's it's like it's like burning man for food. Yeah, and like there's no, by the way, in America, they would be shut down in like four minutes for some sort of health <laughs> violation. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the food was fantastic. The experience was great. One of the, one of the dishes, they fed us directly from the, mm. from the pot. Like they arrived mm. at a pot, took a spoon and fed us. Another mm. dish we had to lick from the from the lid of a Tupperware, uh, there was a, a shawarma dish that arrived as delivery. Like they mm. just they just got <laughs> delivery from it, and it was it was fun. A lot of music, um, lights. It's like a mini rave, and the space was like 
30 square meters. Oh, you're American. I don't know how to do it in America. It's very, it, it was like a long, like, like a long tunnel with 300 like, square feet. No lights on and like fluorescent, like uh, paintings on the walls with black lights and strobes. It's like you're in a nightclub and there was, they were piping in smoke and, um, yeah, and every course came with an alcoholic drink if you were having. Freddie did not, but I did, which is why I don't remember half of the shawarma because they just kept giving you more things to drink. And then at some point, they came, they they discovered my connection to the word FOMO and they brought me in the kitchen to cook, which was a disaster because I'm not good at that. I was plating things. It was just weird, but the point being that we had a great time. And from that conversation came this promise that we would have this this podcast today, right, Freddie? We, we've been meaning to talk for a while. So I think that this was the little cherry that eventually, I'm not sure if little cherry is a good metaphor here. Cerecita. Yeah, this is, the, <laughs> this is the, Cerecita. This is the way that eventually ended up happening. And I'm glad I've, I've, I've been thinking about you, Patrick. I think right, about I, you a lot. I, I think about you too. And I appreciate that. FOMO. FOMO. I want to, now, we just did our little detour to Stockholm, but let's go back to Latin America. Tell us about Platzi. Like, what does it do, and why did you start this company? Platzi is the Latin America's school of technology. We have 5 million students and 3,500 companies that use Platzi to train and prepare their people in cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, English, leadership, and technical skills. Any, if, if you work at a company that does any kind of technology in Latin America, you work with people that study that Platzi. Every single startup, every single company that does software of any kind or a, a job in the digital economy of any kind, for sure, has someone that at some point has taken a course at Platzi. Uh, we started Platzi because we aim to transform Latin America into a technology superpower. And the way that we can do that is by teaching as many people as we can about how to create, not only how to use and consume, but how to create technology. That is marketing, software development, AI, cybersecurity. And at the same time, we want to teach anyone that works with a computer how to really leverage uh, cutting edge technology that will change their lives and their jobs. Everybody needs to learn cybersecurity. Everybody needs to learn AI. And lastly, um, one of the challenges that Latin America has always had is that we are in the same time zone as the largest consumer market in the world, the United States. But we don't really leverage that because mm -hmm. we don't speak English. Only 6% of Latin Americans can hold a conversation in English. Incidentally, a little bit more than the Americans that can, that can speak Spanish. But that's not the point. The point is that we don't speak English at all, only 6%. And the closest you are to the border, the less you speak. For example, in Argentina, 20% of Argentinians, a little bit more than 20%, can speak conversational English. Chile is 23%, Uruguay is 24%, and that's South. Mexico, 5%. Wow. So we don't really speak English. And so we launch an English academy that teaches professional English, and it's validated with TOEFL and everything else. That's it. Our goal is to... Uh, break the cycle of poverty for people and allow them to get a job in the tech industry or in any industry that is enabled by technology and to make companies larger because when companies grow bigger, they have more jobs, better jobs and better jobs at the end of the day are at the core of making people's lives better. And that we think will help to transform Latin America. I'm blown away by those stats. I'm curious. Do you think the difference between like Mexico and Argentina, Chile, Uruguay in terms of language is, is it cultural? Is it the educational system? Like what's driving that? Because I have never heard those numbers before. Yeah, no, it, it, it surprised me as well. Um, I will go for the quality of education. Like if you also yeah. correlate with uh, how many great universities there are, like, yeah, that would be also very similar, like great universities in Chile, in Argentina, in Uruguay, and uh, education systems. Maybe the, the, the counterintuitive thing is how destroyed the Argentinian institutions are. So yeah. it, like it gets surprising, but, but also 
I think it also has to do a little bit with migration. Um, Chile receives a lot of international migration because of their mining operations. Bunch of Germans, bunch of different kinds of Europeans. Uh, Argentinians are practically Italians. Um, yeah, their economies uh, have always been export economies, right? Like they're, they're commodity-based, so there's always an international yeah. relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. While, for example, Colombia. Uh, Colombia is the country with the most expensive cost of transportation within the country because mm -hmm. we have we, we are in the middle of the Andes Mountains. Like, I, I just arrived to Bogota. Uh, I'm originally from Bogota, and I'm here right now, and my city, Bogota, is 2,600 meters above sea level, surrounded by mountains, which makes the view fantastic. I love the view. I, I'm really, I'm, I'm seeing the view right now. But also it makes, it makes transporting anything really hard. We have mm -hmm. the highest cost in Colombia for building tunnels, for example, in the world, connected to like the cost that the Swiss pay. It's just that the Swiss have more money because they have the Nazi gold. And we don't have that. <laughs> um, we, we, can't, we can't build uh, railways. We used to build railways, but it's extremely expensive. Um, and for, to give you another example, the, the, um, the route, the air route, Bogotá, Medellín, is one of the most flown routes in the world. It, it has like the highest frequency, the most amount of planes flying day by day. And Bogotá, Medellín is a 40 minute flight, but there are so many mountains that it will be a 12 hour drive. Wow. Um, so that's very unique and that makes us a little bit more disconnected. And historically that has meant that we get significantly less foreigners, like only only in the past 10 years. Also, there was seen, like, uh, you know, years of violence and unrest, right? So like nobody- Ah, sure, sure, sure. So yeah, we There we was have, that we whole have, thing. By the way, now that's so over, go to Colombia. Wait a minute, Freddie, I, we're going off. I, I, I love this, but I do want to get back to talking about Platzi because let's talk about numbers. Yeah. Like how many people have been trained on Platzi? What is the economic benefit? Like, are these people typically university graduates? Are these folks who have not done, uni like what, just give us like some of the impact numbers. For sure. We have 5 million students. So 5 million people have at some point taken a course at Platzi. Mm. Um, the magic of Platzi is that mostly online education doesn't work. Online education gets like 5 to 10% completion rate. And at Platzi, we get a 70% completion rate. So it wow. really works. Um, we measure outcomes by salary increase in, in our B2C uh, segment, which is the largest. And what we know is that students will increase their income. If, the, if a student studies for one year, one hour per day, which is hard, but doable, students will increase their income three times to 10 times for life. Wow. And when I say this, typically, people have two reactions. One is, oh, that's interesting, wow. And the second is, nah, that's bullshit. That cannot be true. But let me elaborate. In Latin America, the average minimum wage is $300 per month. And the average wage is like $500 to $600 per month. Yeah. Yeah. With $600 per month, you live in a capital city in Latin yeah. America. You live well, and yeah, you have the basics for sure. And the average salary for a software developer will be like $1,500 up to $5,000 to $10,000 per month. So it makes it really easy if you are in that area and then you jump into software development or data science or cybersecurity or digital marketing or you start your own startup to have those jumps of three times to 10 times higher income. Uh, so that's how we measure our outcomes. Yeah, and it's totally, I mean, if you think about it, how many, many of you are listening, you know, you've maybe worked at a startup that had teams offshore where you're paying, because there is a lot of talent in Latin America, thanks to, you know, Platzi and others. You're getting amazing talent. And you have folks who are living in Argentina who are making a dollar salary, getting paid well, and you know, uh, and you, it's like you're living like a king. So it's an incredible arbitrage. Now, I want to talk a little yes. bit about the experience of being a founder, Freddie. I want to talk about how much have you raised at to this point? Uh, like $80 million. $80 million, which by the way, in Latin America, you, that didn't exist like 10 years ago. It's incredible. I mean, you're like, you know, that that's like, you know, it's very unusual and very special. Talk about what it's, you know, but you, you know, you've done Y Combinator, you spend time in the US, like you're, you're, you've got exposure. What's it like, how is it different to be a founder in Latin America? Whew. 
Um, good and bad, let's see. Um, when, when you are in San Francisco, for example, um, I, I, don't, I, I have a love-hate relationship to San Francisco. San Francisco mm -hmm. is where everything happens. Like if you are honest, 90, potentially 99% of artificial intelligence innovation and development happens in a 30 mile radius of San Francisco International Airport. Mm -hmm. um, so you see, you see the ambition, the drive. And the interesting thing about San Francisco and Silicon Valley is that you see that drive as a matter of fact kind of thing. Like people take it for granted. Obviously you want to swing for the fences. Obviously you want to build a billion dollar company. Obviously you are doing extremely weird mathematics that will change the fundamentals of a part of our civilization. While when you get out of there and then you come to Latin America, you get this effect where you are a bigger fish in a smaller pond. So mm -hmm. everybody wants to learn from you and it's like, oh, tell me all of these things. And this can be very harmful for your ego because then you rapidly create a following base and you rapidly create like, like oh yeah, I'm so cool because I went there and then came back here. And I think, I think that's also part of the reason why I've always done education, always, always. My former company since the beginning of, the, of my career, my, my drive has always been, I don't want to be alone on this. I want everybody to know how to do it. And in, in theory, there's nothing special about Silicon Valley or their humans over there. Like a computer that, uh, that is used there and a computer that is used here is the same computer, is the same internet connection, it's the same amount of time. As time goes by, you understand that the environment really pushes you forward. So you get like this responsibility of building community. Um, now it's different, as you mentioned, now the community is a little bit more established, but also it's a little bit more surprising. Lat in Latin America, the startup community has not the shades of Silicon Valley and more of the shades of New York. So yeah. you get to see a lot of financial people and a lot of um, like business people and the uh, MBA people and, and sure, a lot of product and super interesting product ideas. I think that MBAs get a bad rep because you always, uh, like we, we have this tendency of measuring ex strangers by their worst moments. Um, and, and Latin America needs a lot of infrastructure and a lot of basic stuff. And we have truly amazing things. It's just that Latin Americans do a great job at talking shit about themselves and then the rest of the world believes it. Something that, for example, like Saudi Asia doesn't do it. Saudi Asia is cool, but Latin America has places significantly cooler. And we just, do, we just don't see them internationally, even though they're closer to the US, because we keep talking shit about ourselves. Um, so, so changing that is, is a little bit harder, because then you are surrounded by a community of people that are rooting for failure more than for success. Not only for your failure, but for everybody's failure. It's part of the culture. It's a culture that celebrates the fact that we're always at a worse position than anybody else. It's like a victimization culture. So that's not that nice, but thankfully it is changing. And, you, and sadly, uh, yeah, it's sad. Sadly, you see it changing by the people that get out of Latin America to study. And that like their, their younger days, and the way that they shape their vision of the world happens in international places. When you go to study at a university in Canada or in the US, you're not really getting the American culture. You're getting the global culture, mostly because Americans don't go to universities as much. When you go to college in America, you, you see like people from India, from China, from all over the world. And, and then you get to see, at the end of the day, a collection of the most ambitious people. And, and just getting a sense of that ambition and then coming back here and bringing it elevates, uh, we, well, if ideally, we aim to elevate what it means to just go for it. One more thing that I will add to that is that it's just so easy to have a great life in Latin America. It's just oh, so yeah. easy. And, and that's a double-edged sword because that kills ambition. Um, and I think that a part of the reason why the largest companies in the world happen in the US is because the US is so painful and so hard. FOMO. FOMO. You know, it's, I'm thinking about this notion. It is interesting about pulling down or, or, or criticizing others. So I spent a year in, in college in Argentina and uh, I noted that like, yeah, when you stand out a little bit, people like smack you down. 
right? Like, don't be too different. Don't be too special. In America, like, everybody's trying to stick their head above the crowd and be like, I'm special. Uh, to the point where when we, before exams, you, there was this collective mindset where they would find the person who had taken the best notes and photocopy them and give them to everybody in the class versus in Georgetown where I went, like, if you miss class, nobody would give you the notes because they're like, too bad for you. So it's just a totally different approach which has some real qualities to it that are positive for society, but others that are really negative. Now, Freddie, we're gonna do the lightning round in a second. Um, before right. we do, one last question for you, which is, you do have a big social media following. I remember when I met you, like, I, I was like, holy mackerel, who, this guy's everywhere. Is that good for business? Like, you know, is it, is it, do you feel like having a big profile out there drives Platzi? La, <laughs> I have I have pondered on that question a lot. If I were to do this again, I would be as anonymous as I can, and I understand why I didn't do it. You could like turn that. off the social media right now, bro. No, that let me. I I think that I'm a little bit trapped. Um, when we started, we started we started doing live streams. It wasn't even a business around 2012. And we made it into a company with a platform and with like a business model and, and eventually ended up raising money. We were the first Latin American company to go through Y Combinator in 2015. So officially we started in 2015. In 2015, Latin American startups didn't raise capital. We tried. And, and I remember that we were offered $2 million at a point and we we're like, holy shit, we're gonna be able to raise $2 million for like 30% of the company and we were already making a million dollars in annual revenue. Two right. mi the, we were offered $2 million for 30% mm -hmm. of the company and control of the board. Th those were the kind of terms. And those were like very, very Yo, That was pretty terms. much market, right, at the time, which is yeah, crazy. Yeah, that was market at the time. Cray, it cray, yeah. everybody. So, and, and, and we thought of taking it. And then I remember talking with my co-founder and we decided, man, we're already making a million dollars per year. Let's just keep bootstrapping this thing and do whatever we can. And what it meant in practice, what I'm saying, is that how did we get to that million dollars and what happened before? What happened before is that no one even gave us $100,000. No one gave us anything. So when you don't get any kind of cash to start, you have to build it from scratch. And the, not, I'm not sure if the easiest, back then it was the easiest, but the way that we did it, the way that we started from scratch was we have to build content marketing. We have to build a community. We have to build a social media following. It was also different in 2012, 2014, 2016. Social media was a different game and we yeah. were super good at the, at the game that existed back then. The, the algorithms weren't as cruel as they are right now. The bubbles weren't as bubbly. It was easier to emerge content and social networks and media didn't have this uh, obsession with blocking links that took users to a different website. So you mm. could still build traffic to a different kind of property, which is absolutely goddamn impossible to do it today. Um, and the cost of that is that we had to be media people, like, like public people. And, and we did it anyway. We built it. We built, it wasn't a podcast, and we still don't call it a podcast. We mm -hmm. do a, a weekly live show. It's live streamed and with like an, a live audience. And then we cut pieces of that show and upload it to YouTube. And we had like a million subscribers in our YouTube channel, and it became our core marketing strategy. Wow. And, and it worked really well. And that's the reason why you see me everywhere. That's the reason why I have the Twitter followers and the Instagram followers and the YouTube followers. The flip side of that, and the reason why I don't live in Latin America anymore, is because it creates fame. And fame is the goddamn worst. Mm. When you have fame, you don't have privacy. Yeah. Um, not because people are mean or anything like that, but because you are not seen as a person. You're seen as a symbol of something for them. And, and, and so they will ask for you. One time I went into a ditch with my wife. When we were in a bicycle, we both went into a ditch and it was like a super hard crash. And there was blood and we really, we, we were hit so hard that we had to go to the hospital afterwards. Mm. And a guy came running to us. And I thought he's gonna help. Takes his phone out 
and says, you are Freddy from Platzi, let me take a picture, and took a picture while we were down there, wow. and then left. Was like, that a Colombian? Not, that was, that yeah, was, that was a Colombian. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Nobody Colombian from guy. Mexico would leave you in a ditch. It was, it was, it was, it was a Colombian guy. And, and, <sighs> and there are, there are other moments like that. Not all moments are like that. Sometimes are just like, like friendly pictures. But like, yeah. like I, I think about this when, when I see like soccer players, like they get uh, criticized because they want to pe- take pictures with fans. Mm. I am not that famous. I am internet famous. I, mm-hmm. I don't have a million followers anywhere except YouTube. Uh, sure, I sometimes, sometimes I am on TV and stuff like that, but I'm not that famous. And also, I think I'm cute, but I'm not like uh, stereotypically attractive, which is also another thing that happens. And, and <laughs> soccer players are. The reason why I'm saying this is because with all of these variables, if I walk around Mexico City or Bogota or Buenos Aires, at the very least, I will get asked for my picture 10 times yeah. in one day. So imagine how it feels to be a soccer player or a famous actor. Like that feels impossible. Oh yeah, I mean, that's why people lose it after like 20 years. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So Freddie, I think not only are you cute, you have Riz, baby, you're a Rizzly bear. That's what it oh, is. Oh yeah, oh no, no, no. no you the, can't and, teach and, that. And also, I'm getting older and I didn't know that when men grow older, they became more att- they become more attractive. I'm just figuring that out. Oh, I'm yeah. just can getting you, that information. I had no idea. Yes, you just gotta kind of keep it together as much as you can. <laughs> okay, let's hit the lightning round. Now I want quick answers on these. Okay. All right. Quick answers. I got four questions for you. Ready? Yeah. Go for it. Number one. What is a favorite quote? Fear is the mind killer. Okay, I like that. Do you know who said that, or is that a is it a Freddie Vega original? Uh, Frank Herbert, uh, Dune. Oh, perfect. Number two, name a book or podcast that every FOMO sapiens should know about. I think that Meditations from Marcus Aurelius. It's a book that everybody should read. Uh, okay. Marcus Aurelius didn't write it as a book; it was his own diary, mm-hmm. and it's it's just it's it's like extremely important. And a podcast. I love a podcast called Ninety Nine Percent Invisible. It's a yeah. podcast about design, and it used to be for a while the number one podcast in the world, and it's so well done. And it really shows you the care that humans have gone through to build our civilization in the most everyday items in the world. How about what is one piece of advice you give to your former self? Your younger self, excuse me. <laughs> mm. A little bit day by day is better than a lot occasionally. Ooh, I like that a lot. That is so true. Number four, what's your most important memory? Damn. Uh, I know, right? Dude, we don't do it. It's like we go in on this. My most important memory. Punk Royale. (laughs) (laughs) This I I I I'm not sure that I like this uh, th- this answer. If I if I try to dig what's the highest emotional peak that I have mm. recently, like in the past ten years, that is alive in my memory, I think that I distinctly remember the moment that we were accepted into Y Combinator, because it's mm. the moment where we went from outsiders to insiders, and it really changed our lives. Just because like you are accepted in a place that is exclusive. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. That happens, right? Mm. All right, everybody. If you want to find out more about Freddie, you can find, obviously, Platzi is the place to go, but you can find more of him on Twitter at Freddier and on Instagram at Freddier Vega. Yes. Freddie Vega, CEO of Platzi, and just all around Riz Lee Bear. Thank you for coming on FOMO Sapiens. Thank you very much, Patrick. You're also extremely attractive, and it bothers me. <laughs> I try. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com.